And don't stop the applause because your next contestant is truly phenomenal. Please welcome to the stage, Edo Cosplay Creation. Happy after Halloween! I hope you all had an awesome, kick-ass October, a spoopy Halloween, etc. Unfortunately, I was getting my ass kicked with Beam 3D and a couple other projects and just in general, so much exhaustion that I'm starting to hallucinate things, but that's another story entirely. So I didn't really do much for Halloween except sit around uh, at the computer editing video, this video in fact, in my Lucky Cat Kigu. Anyways, this, if you've been following my Power Armor builds, is the video that you've been probably waiting for. A 30 minute extravaganza where I show you basically the design, the printing, the post finishing, and the painting of all the T51 Nuka Cola Power Armor uh, armor plating. Uh, that was shown at TwitchCon, and absolutely, I gotta say, um, I was floored by the response. Like, Adam Savage liked my armor. Like, that pretty much made my... So, anyways, this video is for you if you want to see how I did it all um, in video form. I'm also going to be posting up simultaneously a Reddit slash Imgur post uh, with a photo version of this video, more or less. Little differences here and there. Anyways, my name's Yasu. I run a little prop shop it's called Hero Creations, where I make replica props, costumes from your favorite movies, television shows, and video games. And this is how I made my T51 power armor. Let's get into it. Those new to the channel might be shocked to learn that this is not actually my first set of power armor, but back in 2016, I actually 3D printed my first set of T60 power armor out of PLA filament and walked the stages of both LA Comic Con and C2E2 where I placed in both cosplay contests. Why do another Fallout power armor? Two reasons. First, someone essentially told me that I would never do another set of armor again that would be nearly as good as T60. I confess drinks were involved and I was determined to prove them wrong. Second, there were lots of design choices I had made in modeling and assembling T60 that I did not like and if given the motivation, I would have loved to have another crack at. And thus, T51 Nuka Cola Power Armor became a thing. Now you might ask, why T51 over another quote unquote cool set like the X01? That's an easy answer. The paint job on the Nuka Cola Power Armor is by far one of my favorites I've seen, and the minute I saw it in the Nuka Cola DLC in Fallout 4, I knew I had to take a crack at that paint job. I also want to take a pause and thank the sponsor of this build, Saint Smart for providing not only the TPU and PLA that made this build a reality, but they also provided two CR10-S5s that greatly sped up and simplified the build. In addition to the equipment and the consumables, their faith in my abilities and the vision of the build never ever wavered. Not when I started falling behind schedule, and not when I actually stopped believing in my own abilities for a while. So huge shout out to an amazing company and amazing people within that company for helping me on this build. Anyways, enough to waddling, let's get started. Step one, the modeling. For this build, I made the call that I wanted to model this from scratch using only 2D references from screenshots in the game or art books. No game rips for modeling or reference. My reasoning here was simple. Fallout 4 game rips translate very poorly to the real world use and for printing 
because most of the main details are loaded on texture maps as opposed to the actual 3D model itself. Also, Bethesda models have a legendary reputation for clipping into each other, which obviously doesn't happen in the real world. So my modeler of choice was my trusty favorite parametric modeler, Fusion 360, and some choice references from the Art of Fallout 4 book. It took me about 168 hours over the course of a month to model the entire first version of the T-51 power armor. Naturally, I would put an hour to tour here and there to tweak things I did not like about the armor or add mounts for the hardware later on, but I lost count of those hours. I'm not going to bore you with the super details, but essentially I used two different workflows within Fusion 360 to get the shapes I wanted. For the very fluid rounded shapes like the thighs and the shoulders, I used Fusion's T-spline tools to sculpt, air quotes, the model into a shape that I wanted, while preserving the proportions that was needed to match the rest of the armor. For the simpler, more manufactured shapes like the chest plate, I extensively used sketch tools and extruded and cut the, uh, the model until I had the shapes I wanted. Essentially, basic cut and dry hard surface modeling. The most challenging part is probably the helmet since I had to combine several organic and hard surface shapes together in order to get an accurate silhouette of the helmet. One thing to note with the helmet is I actually opted to use the Fallout 76 uh, version as opposed to the version seen in either Fallout 3, Fallout New Vegas, or Fallout 4, which have some subtle differences at the front of the helmet. So once I felt good that the 3D model I had created matched my references, I had to make sure that the scale matched the 7 feet 6 inch tall estimate I'd come up with based off of the power armor seen in the live action trailer of Fallout 4, where the solo survivor can be seen stepping into a 10 to 12 inch platform over the quote unquote feet in order to get into the armor and get sealed in. After that, it was time to print. Now from past videos on my channel, you can see that I have a lot of printers, but they're usually working on other projects. So for T51, I allocated six printers to the task, which include three CR10S5s that I'd modified to run on a direct drive extruder, two custom Core XYD bots, which I had modded over the years. Then towards the end of the build, during the lead up to TwitchCon, I used a Beam 3D Prism uh, Pro-type resin printer to pump out a few detailed parts that I just did not feel like sanding, like the rivets or the details on the helmet. For the build, I ended up consuming a total of 80 pounds of TPU and about 10 pounds of PLA leaving the final weight of the armor with hardware and stilts included weighing in at about 85 pounds. So as you can tell, for the most part, I was extremely efficient in cutting support waste and avoiding print failures that would have burned through filament like crazy. At this point, you might be asking me, why Yasu did you use TPU filament? Simple answer, durability. After C2E2, my PLA T60 armor had all sorts of micro cracks and signs of serious wear in places where the armor had started rubbing up against each other while I walked. Now, while I probably would have had better results than PLA using another engineering grade material like PETG or ABS, I honestly wanted to see what would happen if I went to the other extreme and picked a material that was so tough and abrasion resistant that would be unbreakable. In the end, I chose TPU over other flexible materials that was significantly easier to print than say nylon. I quickly learned to stop counting print time in hours and started quoting the total figure in days. In the end, it took about 98 or so solid 24 hour days across six printers in order to print out the full set of armor. For the most part, my FDM machines were using E3D Volcanoes with 0.6 millimeter nozzles, which kept print times relatively quick since I was printing out most of the parts completely whole on a 500 cubic millimeter build volume on the S5s. To ensure my print times were only going to take a few days versus a week or two, I printed with very thick layer heights, ranging from at the low end 0.3 millimeters to as much as 0.5 millimeters on some parts. 
Since I knew I would be completely coding and post-processing it, it was not a big issue for me to have such huge layer heights. And when you really get down to it, trying to smooth out 0.3 millimeters point versus 0.5 millimeters really doesn't take that much extra time. As parts started getting printed, my next step was to start the post-processing and getting those prints nice and smooth. There were a few steps in this process. Step one, remove supports. Step two, cutting and burning off any stringing while not setting myself on fire in the process, which is a bit harder than it actually sounds. Step three, gluing multi-part prints together using a 3D print pen loaded with, you guessed it, more TPU. Step four, applying flexible drywall spackle from the local hardware store onto any seams of any multi-part prints or areas that had significant under extrusion or some other gap. Step five, after that flexible drywall spackle dried, sand it smooth so that the seams would just disappear and just not be able to be felt at all. Step six, brush on thin coats of epoxy to form a smooth, semi-rigid outer shell to paint on. Later on, I substitute the epoxy for UV cure resins. And boom, the raw TPU print transformed into something that does not look like a print. Granted, I will note it took me a very long time to do this on the entire set of armor. Now bear with me, that whole process only got rid of the print lines. We still have a long road ahead of us in order to paint and weather the armor to get that standing for 200 years in storage look. The first step, of course, in the painting was to prime the entire armor with sandable filler primer which once dried, I would lightly wet sand the whole thing with 400 and 800 grit sandpaper. Then the next step was to add a slightly bumpy texture to the surface of the armor plane that would make it look more like cast metal, which would also have the side effect of hiding any potential imperfections I might have missed in the smoothing process. The cast metal look was my idea of a homage to the fact that these sets of power armor were essentially the Fallout Universe's idea of tanks, albeit walking ones. To get that effect, I used stone texture paint from your local Home Depot or Lowe's and did very few light and quick passes as you do not want full coverage of the armor with this stone paint. From there, I added a base coat of bright red that forms the foundation for Nuka-Cola armor colors. Obviously, the paint job is too clean to pass for 200 years of hard living, so steps had to be taken to weather some of the parts of the armor down but not go overboard as I wanted to match my game and art book references as closely as I could. Ooh. 
This included a range of weathering techniques like airbrushing a mix of browns and dark blues to simulate grime and add some shading, dry brushing light and dark metallic silver paints to simulate scratched or ground down metal, and of course my personal favorite of using a mix of cinnamon, paprika, and dollar store curry powder to simulate rust effects. And boy, say what you want about weathering with spices, but you, your armor ends up smelling so good. Once the base coat had cured, I masked off the right areas and started spraying the white trim colors.
Some armor plates like the shoulders and thighs had additional details like the pinup Nuka Girl illustration and several Nuka Cola lettering on each plate. To do that, I did several extra steps starting with getting some vinyl to cut stencils out of. As you can see from the footage, I actually tried making paper stencils and spraying over them but I quickly found that they were not effective and I definitely don't recommend using paper stencils. Spend out the extra money and make your own vinyl stencils, even if you have to cut them out by hand. But in contrast, vinyl stencils were relatively easy to hand cut and apply for the most part, and they stayed on even for second and third applications, effectively masking out the shapes I wanted with no real overspray. And in the few spots, I did get some overspray on the base coat, it was easy enough for me to touch up with a brush and some extra red paint. Now the pinup girls were a tad harder. First, I had to cut out more vinyl circles and airbrush the base circles with a custom mixed um, cream color I'd put together. Then courtesy of my friends at Wasteland Imports who were awesome enough to print them I used laser printed water slide decals, which needed to be trimmed before I could apply them. Once the water slide decals had clean cut edges, I could then soak each decal in water and apply them. Of course, taking care to make sure to smooth out any wrinkles or air bubbles underneath it.
once I'd add the additional details like the Nuka Cola Girls and text, my next steps were to weather those fresh looking areas to match the rest of the armor.
And that, my friends, is how I built all the external armor playing of T-51 Nuka-Cola Power Armor. Now, by no means, even though that this is a 30 minute long video, is this the last video on the topic or the final word? In fact, I got a couple more videos that I want to delve deeper into the build on, such as how I uh, took a set of drywall stilts, modified them, and made them a lot more stable, at least for my particular build. Uh, let's see, what else? How I did the jointing using uh, garage springs. Uh, the internal frame of the armor, etc., etc. There's a lot of deeper, less visible parts of the armor that were important and I believe could be of some value to you. So anyways, thank you so much for watching. I hope you found it helpful, interesting, or entertaining. If you want to see more T-51 content, let me know in the comments. Um, otherwise, if you want to see more crazy builds and videos, etc., I totally recommend you should totally hit that subscribe button and the notification bell so you start seeing more of my videos. Since the YouTube algorithm right now is all over the place, I'd really appreciate that you hit that like button because that is the one thing that will help tell YouTube to show my content, my T51 videos, to more people. So anyways, thank you for watching. See you in the next video. Amazing. Tito spent more than 1,000 hours modeling, printing, and processing the full set of armor and props that you see on stage today. It took three different 3D printers working nonstop for 98 days to create this armor out of 30 kilograms of TPU filament and 5 kilograms of PLA filament. Once the printers finished their jobs and took a well-earned printer vacation, Hito got to smoothing them out using drywall spackle, bar top epoxy, and filler primer. The whole look was finished with a base coat of spray paint, followed by airbrushing to apply highlights, shading, and weathering. And now he looks ready to take on a mythic death claw, or maybe seven. <laughs> Give it up again for Hito Cosplay Creations! And of course, his phenomenal T-51 Nuka-Cola.